the one that gets the most focus. Yeah. <laughs> First half of the year. No, First half of the year is always. Yeah. Oh, I come, come from a public school background, so very uh, familiar with this problem. Yeah, very enthusiastic. Served on school boards, and uh, you know, my father was a high school principal, so. Oh, okay, good. And well, good. It, it, it will help, you know, having a little bit of understanding of where we're coming from. Although yeah, we're yeah. usually pretty good with, with the yeah. interaction back yeah. and forth. It's, 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 it's pretty open. Yeah. It's always just a matter of aligning the needs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's always the question. Right. You know, not ev nobody ever gets exactly what they want. Right. That's, yeah. that's the key. Yeah. We're good? Go ahead. All right. Welcome to um, our finance committee meeting, which is Thursday, July 20th. Um, we're starting at. 916. Um, today is a joint workshop with the uh, School Finance Committee. And so I'm going to call to order with a roll call of Ed Blaze, Councilor Donovan, also joining us is um, Christine Massengill, Chris Tiazzo, Jen Lang, and Tom Hall. Um, so the purpose of the workshop was just to discuss um, upcoming fiscal year budget goals. Um, between our departments um, to kind of get a little handle on things as they, um, what do you foresee coming? Um, that would be a significant change. Um, as you know, or, or you will now, <laughs> we did have a goal um, set from the council to try to bring uh, a low impact budget um, as far as increase this year. Um, and um, what you do have in front of you today is just some materials about um, trends. So this would be um, two documents, the first one being um, Town of Scarborough five-year gross budget. Um, what you see is it's a five-year trend of where we're spending the money, um, and then again a five-year trend of how much less revenue we have <laughs> through. Um, and it, that is inclusive of state funding as well? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, the other document you'll see is um, evaluation and tax commit commitment comparison um, for a 10-year period. It will show you the trends of our total valuation, um, what our tax commitment has been, that's the bill um, total package out to the um, citizens, the change from that, the mill rate, um, that's the tax rate, um, what the change in the mill rate, was, mill rate was, and what we often refer to um, in the budgeting process when we say the impact, the impact going out. Um, the valuation average is a $300,000 home, so when we're in our council discussions, we talk about the average impact. Um, so that's the dollar value of um, increase to homeowners over um, a five-year period. Um, I'll let Tom explain a little more better than I can about the dynamics of, you will see in 2010 it says zero. Um, that was not because we necessarily had zero Increase that was our real no, we used fund balance. We oh, consciously that was the fund used uh, fund balance yeah. reserves on hand to, uh, to negate any tax. The increase. Neg negative third, I, just, I meant the other one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. had one year which was yes, the, the 2010 year, we completely held the line on the budget and used fund balance mm -hmm. to offset the cost. So that was a zero impact year. Um, but the other zero impact year is the reevaluation. That's right. Yep. So yeah, th you know, I, I, these are helpful. I think uh, just in terms of looking at broad trends, there's uh, a lot of backstory with kind of each and every one of these elements. But you know, the general trends that I think we just need to be aware of is that our valuation, though comparatively to other main communities, continues to grow. It's grown at a slower pace than it did for the last couple of decades. Frankly, mm -hmm. uh, there was a time in the early 2000s where we were seeing, on average, about 60 million dollars of growth year to year that extra value gave us a lot of spending room without uh, needing to impact the tax rate much at all. Uh, as that growth year to year uh, tightens, if you will, or slows, uh, we see it in the tax rate. I guess the other trend is that at the same time, and you look at the commitment column, um, we're needing to raise more money to support local causes. And, and really, that has two parts to it. Um, one is um, we need to be vigilant on what we spend, but also what we see in that number is the reduction in non-property tax revenue sources from all sorts of sources. 
And so those two things working in concert, we're spending more than we did last year, and we're getting less than we got last year, again, shows its ugly face uh, in the tax rate increase. And I guess the, the takeaway for me is that, uh, you know, I think we are, and, and folks around this table have acknowledged this, I think we're, uh, you know, really on this un almost unsustainable path. Uh, we can't be looking at two and three hundred dollar increases uh, in annual tax bills. Um, I think we're really playing with fire in many respects. And I, I think that's the, the rallying cry that we all need to be aware of and working toward, that we need to find a way to stem this what seems to be annual growth uh, in that two to three hundred dollar range for every ta you know average taxpayers. Tom, can you explain commitment a little bit more? I'm sure. not that familiar with. The, the commitment is the amount we need to raise. So that's the amount that we uh, give to the assessor once you've done your budget, adopted your budget. That's the amount that needs to be raised to support local causes through property taxes. Through property, yes. so that, property. Is, that is solely a property. So what, essentially, what this is showing is we've gone from a demand on property taxes ten years ago of 35 million up to 54 million. That's correct. That's correct. And again, the two components of that number are how much we're spending. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mean to minimize the importance of that, and that's what these committees, um, you know, are focused on doing, looking at how we're spending our money. But it also shows the loss of non-property tax revenue. So every dollar we lose from outside uh, needs to be raised locally. Make sense? Yes. Make, makes perfect sense. I, I, from from our perspective, I mean, obviously there is the bigger picture that needs to be addressed. Um, the, the challenge we have on the school board side of things is we really do not have an opportunity to generate revenue. That's one of the challenges that we have. We're, we're, we are a very large cost. We're the, one of the largest costs in the budget. And the predominantly those costs are are based on um, employment figures for the most part. We're almost the antithesis of what a normal municipal department would be. If, if we, if just as a rule of thumb, and Tom, you probably can speak mm -hmm. more to the details of that, I mean, generally 85% of our costs are in salaries and, and personnel and, and, and that kind of expense. So 15% is really in our infrastructure and our equipment and our programs and our, our textbooks and all of the other stuff. So it's, it's, it's sometimes more challenging from a school department perspective to, to sit there and, and talk about um, making reductions or making, making cutbacks because we're really only looking at a very small percentage that we can impact without talking about employment reductions, which is a word that nobody really likes to hear. Um, I, I think what's important, one of the things that we try to do on the school board side of things that, that may or may not help, I'm not sure, um, is looking at this relative to the communities around us. Um, one of the things that was very positive that I saw from, from our side when looking at numbers is that there is a point of relativity and, and we're looking at this as a microcosm of, of Scarborough, which is important because that's what we can directly impact, but I think it's important to look as it, at the general economic picture of the region to see what the communities around us are doing as well. Um, and I think you'll, you'll I, I'd be surprised if you saw anything radically different other than the fact that what, what I've heard from feedback is that we've done an excellent job as a community maintaining our property values. Um, uh, we may not have in grown as much as we, as we have in the past, but there were several communities in the region that actually shrank. Um, so when it comes to that external source of revenue from the state, those are factors sometimes that, that play in against us. So I, I think that it's, it's good to have that trending knowledge there. I also think it's good to do it on a comparison basis because when you're looking at things like growth, um, one of the questions I would have is what's driving growth in the community? And if we're not generating, I know business is an important thing to try and draw businesses in, but if our growth in the past has been from families moving in and from families looking at communities and evaluating where they want to live, the school budget is or the school, the school system is a real critical piece to that. Uh, in the past, we've been very successful and very lucky. It, it has been a, 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 um, a plus for our community, for sure. But if you look at the funding levels that we've looked at consistently over the same trend, what we find is you'll have almost like a sine curve. You'll have flat funding, then we'll have a spike, then we'll have a, a drop-off, and then a spike, and then a drop-off. And, and there, are, there are statistical correlations that we can make with the funding level versus the performance of the, the kids. And it's not necessarily an impact that happens exactly at that year. The, what we do this year 
may impact kids two, three, four years down the road during with graduations and things like you know what their what their quali qualifications are for graduation and things like that. So I, I my only point in raising all of that stuff is to say I, I we completely understand the need to look at Scarborough, the trending specifically what you guys are up against. You have to look at everything. Um, we have to look at it from a perspective of our obligation to meet the the mandates that we have as well as providing a, a good quality education for, for each student. And in the past, the trending level has been very, very much below average. And that's one of the reasons why we present to you guys on a regular basis that cohort comparison. Um, you know, it, the, the, the strategy of going through and saying we need to, there's, there's low hanging fruit if there would be in the budget. There are issues that we can tighten up a little bit. There are things that we can massage. Um, I, I think we're always open to, to new ideas, but in terms of low-hanging fruit, or the ability to, to make a 20% reduction or a 10% reduction in, in something other than services really isn't, isn't there. It's just, it's, we're, we're pretty tight, and I think comparatively to the other communities, we, can, we certainly can show that in terms of our, our expenditure per pupil and our expenditure, how much we spend on administration, transportation, and things like that, and it's a good average, a good comparison amongst the communities. Um, one of the things that we've, we've, been, we've been talking about a little bit is, is and, and it's more of a vernacular kind of thing, I think, um, the, the, the difference, if you will, between having level funding versus level services. Because as you know, with contracts and things like that, there are typically step increases that are associated with, with contracts. We have some that we're negotiating right now. Um, we have some that are in place, um, and we also have, like the town does, increases in fuel costs, other increases that if we flat fund, then that money has to be made up somewhere, understandably. That means it has to come out of the services. Let me board. interrupt yes. you for just a moment. Um, I, I guess I, I want to make sure that it's clarified. Although our goal was flat funding, it had the exception of we appreciate that there will be things that are fixed costs that are somewhat uncontrollable. So your fuel lines are going to be more, if you were to lose more funding from the state. And historically, we've always, you know, as you'll see in the analysis, we've moved our money to the school department mm -hmm. um, to the point of, you know, reducing what we spend on a town municipal level. Right. Um, so I guess. The biggest thing I want to just make sure is I know the big hurdles have been overcome. Um, there was some step pay grade raises that needed to be, you know, scales to be adjusted. Um, we're past the worst of that, so we should be looking probably more at just the typical pay grade raises. Uh, we face that on the municipal side as well. Um, we've been very fortunate to have contracts negotiated um, where, you know, mm -hmm. And you'll see, even though we're still giving our raises, we're still, you know, looking in those other areas of where we can bring bring the spending in. Um, I don't see that um, and well, that desire to to help you maintain where you are, changing any. And that was the consensus I left with at the council meeting. I'm looking at both of you saying, feel free to correct me. Um, certainly, we appreciate there are some fixed costs that, that are going to be associated with that you, you can't have. If the state of Maine doesn't give you 1.2 million, we understand that that's not something that can be absorbed in a single year, um, and we will work towards helping you bridge that gap. My concern is, and I think the concern with the council was, if we need to move to a self-funding mechanism for Scarborough, um, and, and uh, that's what we need long-term from you guys, is are we needing to be? I mean, the trend keeps going a million a year out of the state that you guys lose, and eventually, I mean, I only think we have maybe four left, four million that you no, guys right. get. Um, yep. So, you know, instead of the reactive plans, oh, we lost it. Right pre-plan for it, that maybe that's just where we need to go. Uh, you know, no more big swings, no more. We are self-funding, and if we need a growth plan based on the self-funding levels, then we can work towards something um, in the future. Um, but again, just to reiterate, we're, we're not asking for, you know, if you have huge reductions or, you know, at least it, I know fuel is, <laughs> even when we, when we fix cost, it, it, it's going to be more than last year, and, and those items come up. Um, 
The other thing I might want to just kind of mention, I know um, from a goal perspective, um, I don't think it made our list this year, but it's always been something that's followed along with, is um, innovative ideas, I, I, and especially green technologies. Um, don't necessarily throw out an idea just because we said flatlined. Um, as we passed last night our tri-gen model, we have solar panels going on some of our municipal buildings. Um, there's, of course, an upfront cost in this, but there's a long-term payback. So, you know, if you have programs, incentives, ideas, things like that, that yes, you would be technically this year more money, but has that turnaround to it, by all means, please do include it. Absolutely. And I think we had something in the vicinity of almost like 190,000 a year savings. I, I think I'm trying to remember my paperwork. The TriGen model would That's save more than more uh, order of 150 thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Uh, so certainly 150 thousand a year in a budget's a lot of new wiggle room <laughs> for, for other things. So the conversations we've had Absolutely. about the TriGen and perhaps schools <coughs> being able to you know share in that as well because I know we share some of the other things. The IT yeah, in fact, that's a, a interesting point. I, I was going to take it up with Todd Jepson and the folks upstairs, but um, the extra power that we're producing that's not consumed here, most notably it will be you know, best used at the high school. It's a huge right. consumer of electricity. We need to come up with an internal arrangement whereby you actually buy that power from us because we want to be able to reap that benefit of savings. We need to show that in our budget. And we, we can do it in such a way that we sell it to you at a very attractive price, far less than you're paying now. So you'll see some modest benefit as well in terms of reduced energy costs, and we will see some revenue. Uh, th th those are some details we need to sort through. I, I think uh, and the cogen or the trigen is, is a great model. I think one of the benefits we have in the community is that we, are, we have a, a very centralized, for the most part, a centralized campus right mm -hmm. now for our, our three grade three and above. Um, I think what you may find is we, we've started on our, our long-term planning committee, and, and Jane is the chairperson of, of that committee. Um, we've started looking at uh, facilities analysis. We're looking at energy consumption and things across the board. I think what we may find, that there may be not necessarily some surprises, but you mentioned the high school being a large consumer of energy. Right now, the middle school seems to be the one that consumes the most because that runs a lot of the summer programs, mm -hmm. and that has an air conditioning system built into it, so that's running all the time year-round. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the town benefits from that as well for community services and other programs, and we run our, our summer programs through that. So that, you're right, if we can find a way to, to mm -hmm. link those kinds of programs together, I think that's a, that would be a, a, very, a, a very positive thing. Um, we are, we are starting to look at um, long-term investments on, on our facilities to make sure that we, we can avoid the, the reactionary types of, of things and, and plan our, our maintenance budgets and our long-term capital budgets a lot better. Um, right now, it, we, we have some of that information in-house, but the, we, we have a consultant that we brought in to, to do a full evaluation of all the facilities as well. So we're hoping what we get from that is a really good plan of, of um, what we really have in-house right now, um, uh, maybe some demographics and some, some um, projections of, of, of usage utilization later on. And then we can start talking amongst, a, amongst the two groups of how do we want to address these, these long-term plans, and, and whether it's cogen which is their trigen, which I think is a great opportunity. Maybe if that's what I think it is, it's an expandable type of system, is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe long-term, uh, the infrastructure, it would, it would make sense whether we work out a power sharing agreement or we invest in part of that infrastructure somehow, some way, so that the, the, the cost benefits in yeah. the community is certainly much. The initial yeah. model was to actually site the size and site a facility midpoint of the campus and serve it, be able to service multiple buildings. We back away from that and, and have chosen to do a town hall a town hall only, but that same concept is still available. It's, mm -hmm. it's essentially way think of college campuses with the steam right. plant that exactly. um, was exactly. located yep. somewhere central and serviced all the buildings, it's the same concept, and we have the luxury of the campus uh, to look at that kind of thing. And I might, I think I might be throwing you under the bus, but <laughs> are, are you in an energy <laughs> committee? <laughs> 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 really, get in line. Yeah, sure. Um, so are, you're an energy committee, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. Are you yes. the liaison to yes. that? Um, yes. It mm -hmm. sounds like maybe it might be beneficial to have a some kind of a workshop yeah, setting yeah. to 
question. I do, and I think Tom's idea of talking mm -hmm. it, it, at an administrative level would spur this on because I think you would benefit tremendously. This, all the engineering mm -hmm. legwork has now been done and we've committed to a design, mm -hmm. and I think uh, uh, a We also lot have that solar project, which yeah. was very interesting. There was... Where are you putting solar panels? Um, uh, the Community Services Maintenance Building next to the ice rink. So right on down. the building or next to it? On the building, on the roof. Right on the roof. South-facing roof, and then the North Scarborough Fire Station. So those are kind of the first two, and uh, given our success, and I expect we'll have great success, I think we'll look at expanding that. The yeah, schools are, obviously, because they, they don't have a lot of things. The things that kill solar power is when you have anything that blocks it. So if you can put it on the roof of a building, uh, and they're not heavy, and we yeah. have a lot of surface area on a lot See, of the roofs. That's yeah. it, it, it's a it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. yeah what I hear you, what, what I think we're talking about is really looking at longer term kind of structural issues that aren't going to happen between this budget that's year and, that, and next budget year, but long term they'll make the difference. And I know George and I have been talking, uh, you know, using that same theme as we talk about salary and more importantly benefits. Mm -hmm. If you look at the expense to uh, the school side on health care benefits alone, it is massive. And that's, um, you know, in the approaching 10% increases every year, it seems, yeah. right? Well. Uh, if we can get some control over those costs, that can make huge differences down the road. Mm -hmm. But that requires negotiation at the table. It requires a, a lo much longer process to get those sorts of changes in place. And I, I know a number of those proposals are part of the current negotiations in terms of moving them from the traditional health care plans that they are accustomed to to some of the newer, more flexible plans, higher deductible and, and right. such. Mm -hmm. I, well, I mean, I think we could speak to the administrative contract because that's been concluded. There was some, there was some good, um, some good um, discussions and good um, collaboration for the administrative contract. And it's a very small portion, but um, it was a good, um, I think a good testament to working together to try and resolve some of the systemic issues. As you said, the, the, the constant skyrocketing um, medical costs and things like that. So I, I, think, I think everybody's aware of that, and, and it's, not just a, it's not just a municipal issue. I think that's happening across the society and the culture, and we are addressing that, and people are, I tend to be a little bit more open to that, hopefully. Um, but that is, that, is a, that is a process of the negotiation. So it's very difficult for us to target it, it's good to have goals like that um, and, and work towards those, but it's very difficult for us to start out with, it, with an understanding of, okay, we need an X amount of reduction at this point. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, I don't know how that would affect our negotiating position. Well, you have to, you know, good faith negotiation. I mean, when we come to the table, we have a list, and we know what we're trying to accomplish. And you have to, there's always a meet in the middle type of thing, you know, so we'll give this, but we need this, or, you know, if you can give this, we can try to do this, and, you know, some of those things that we're but it, really uh, working towards with the health insurance piece, and like Tom said, you know, shared, you know, deductible kinds of things. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's clear, and I want to convey to you guys that we're, we're aware of where the biggest cost impacts are for us. I mean, we, we can look through, drill down through the budget and look at the line item stuff, and, and really what we get into a situation of is, is, um, you know, if we if we are in a position where we are short funding, I mean, really we, we, we didn't last year and we haven't, and really the school department doesn't want to be in the situation of looking at revenue generation um, because we're, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's an unusual, I think, position to put the school department in to be a revenue source. And when you say that, you're talking about um, parking fees, activity fees. In the end, they don't amount to much. They, they don't. They cause a lot of headache and strife and don't, right. don't and produce a lot of much revenue. Hours. Right. A lot of, a lot right. of extra hours. Right. Right. But, I mean, and that's, you know, that's, that's a product of where we're at. Um, I, you know, I think that there are, there are some, some things that we're working on long term to maybe address some of those, those types of issues to, to um, you know, again, uh, ultimately, it, it's not a big revenue stream. It does sometimes create a little bit more problems for us than, than, than we'd like. But, but the point of the matter is, is as, as Tom had mentioned earlier, we've got a real challenge with shrinking revenue. Um, and and the one of the ways I think we can, that, that I'd like to convey to, to look at this stuff is the investment in the school department is, is one of the things that helps draw people. Um, and, and
and I know that doesn't fall on, on deaf ears with you guys, and, and you all understand that, that it's, that the, that's why we like to compare to other communities, one of the reasons why, because that, that is a big draw for our community, and more people that we talk to that have relocated young families, new people moving in, relocating to the area, that is one of their primary concerns, and, and I think we've, as a community, um, looked at the, the, the bare bones funding and the minimal funding at the education level for so long that we've kind of set that benchmark really, really down low. So one of the things we're trying to do as a, as a group and as a board is to do those slow incremental increases to at least get us up to, um, you know, as we've talked in the past, not even middle of the road, middle, middle of the pack in that group. And, and I know, and I know it's, it's, that's the big balance. Yeah. That's the real challenge that we're facing is how do, we, how do we accomplish that and how do we look at ways like the TriGen mm -hmm. and ways like, um, you know, um, I sharing of, of departments and resources and things like that. I, I think those are some of the tangible things that we can start doing and then holding, maximizing those budget returns a little bit better. So I just want to interject one yeah. other, um, I guess, concern that arises of it is, you know, certainly we've been supportive of the schools and, you know, our numbers show that that's where we're floating our money. Um, the concern is, too, um, certainly it's to the cost of we're not doing anything. We're not working our staffing plans. We're not working um, some of our models. And so, um, you know, our contracts are bottomed out more or less. I mean, there's a little bit, there is some thought about maybe trying to work, you know, some, some benefits down to maybe one more level. But we've held the line as much as we can, and, and that's something I think everybody needs to be very aware of that moving forward from here on out, yes, we can do some more shared services, but there's really nothing left to hold the line to. Um, we're at a point where as much as the schools draw people and families in, the safety of your neighborhood also plays that factor. And if it's an unsafe neighborhood, people don't move. Um, and that's the problem we're now starting to face. We have, you know, Staffing in the PD, we have staffing at the fire barns. These problems are already starting to crop up where the calls come in. Maybe there's not somebody to drive the truck, so we're dispatching it out of a different barn. We have major staffing that we know we need to do, and so you're not going to be able to see us holding the line as much as we were before. So if we take impacts, and, and our trend has been that you know, high hundreds, low, you know, some more about that $200 mark, and all that money on an impact is just school. Now add to that the impacts from us, you know, needing to put to put a four-person team on last year for paramedics. This is an example. We had a huge issue with paramedics and overtime and coverage, and we were running a million dollars in overtime. We had to add paramedics. It, it was to the point of we couldn't hold off anymore. Well, in order to do that, adds another million. It, it, it's it's all subjective. So, um, I, I just want to brace yourselves that we have to the point that we can't hold it anymore. So those things are going to start popping up. Those staffing plans. Yeah, I'm I'm new to all of this, so I'm I, I, listening to Chris. I uh, understand exactly what he was saying. Uh, what I don't know is does does our when we talk about, you know, 85% of your costs are are kind of fixed and in, in uh, employee focused. Tom, is the uh, is the municipal side of that materially different? Um, certainly not that high. I think we're in the 60s range in terms of fixed cost. Uh, Ruth might be able to be more exact, but the school I think has a higher um, challenge in that regard. That the vast majority of their budget is fixed in salaries and benefits, essentially. That's not to say that you can't do something about that. There are impacts of doing something about that. Um, we have chosen through uh, to take advantage of early retirement and attrition opportunities not to fill positions. And so we've been able to avoid the, the layoff scenario, but we have shrunk our workforce as a result of taking advantage of opportunities. There are consequences. Uh, you know, simple example, there used to be three full-time folks in the clerk's office, and we now do it with two and they're all stretched a little thinner. And uh, generally speaking, I think we've survived that okay, but there's not much, there's no give anymore. Uh, we're all and kind of at capacity. That, that was the other question that I, 
think Chris's point was that, uh, and I think he said uh, on a comparison basis, uh, we were below average uh, with from other towns. A, from a funding point of view. That's fairly well documented. The Department of Education does a kind of a, a comparative benchmark analysis that uses and apples to apples comparisons. And are we overfunded on the municipal side? Are our police and fire and town hall? Services? I would say not. I mean, we did, there's not as uh, uh, we don't have available the same sort of uh, metrics that the school does because the Department of Education does this statewide. Um, a number of communities, and we've actually taken the lead on this, uh, attempt to do a, a, a benchmark analysis. Um, if I haven't shared that with you, I can share it with you. Um, and uh, so generally speaking, I don't think we're out of line. There's a couple of flags uh, on that analysis. Uh, our debt load is higher than average, but generally speaking, what we're paying per capita and such uh, for different services, I think, is perfectly in line with our, yeah. uh, you know, with, with comparable communities. I, just on the issue of benchmark, I know uh, it's a it's a very it's not inappropriate to bring up. But I would just suggest that that shouldn't be the first thing you look at and hide behind. That's really a way to validate what you're looking for. And from my perspective, your budget ought to be able to be justified in its own right, first and foremost. And then, oh by the way, this is how we stack up to our comparisons. And I just offer that as an observation. In past years, I've seen the benchmark, the cohort analysis, being the lead. Um, as opposed to the budget justification being the lead. Yeah. I, I, and, I, and I think we can do that with, with test scores and state nine scores. I mean, you can't really look at the, the, the ranking system that came out of the state. That was, that was really not a very strong uh, measurement. Of, no, of we had a good grade. But on the flip side, I mean, and that's a testament, really, to what we've been able to do with what we're doing with what we have, really. Um, I, I agree with you, Tom, that, that the, you know, it, there's always the so what. You know, what are we really getting for the money that we're investing here? And I think you'll find that if we go back and look at compared, what, what metric do we want to measure? Do we want to measure with graduation rates? Do we want to measure with, with test scores? Um, do we want to measure at different grades of the test scores? The metrics are available out there, and we certainly do look at those. Um, I think you'll find, again, that it, you know, unfortunately, it may not be a direct correlation but you'll find that we are not the highest performing district in the region. And no, but and I bet you would say, my observation is that we are by far and away getting the best value. If you look at almost all the achievement mm -hmm. stats, yes, we're not leading the pack, but we're very solidly in the middle and maybe on the upper and I, I quartile. Think that's, a subjective, that's a subjective measurement. That is a subjective measurement of what value we're getting because, again, if you have a question of we're cutting, let's say, foreign, aid, uh, foreign language, for example, that's been an area that we've looked at in the past. Are we getting by with only two years of foreign language in the high school? Sure, we could do that. But how does that impact us? Uh, how does it impact that individual student when they go to a college application? Are they not getting in to the higher level schools because we're not providing them with the right basis that they're looking for? Well, and then, and the flip side of that too is, are we, you know, um, are we providing enough opportunities for our students that aren't going on to college level um, on the vocational side of things? We may be able to get a, get away with lower. Um, uh, lower contribution rates, let's say, to a Westbrook Regional or a Portland Regional, but are we shortchanging those students because we're not giving them those opportunities to maximize their potential? And, and ultimately, I know that there has to be a happy medium in between there, and I think that's where we always get into the discussions of what do we think is, what, when is good good enough, and what is good enough? And, and that really, and, and, and the funding does play into that, for sure. I think the real discussion is going to be what, what does this community want for a school system? Uh, what are they willing to accept? Uh, are they willing to accept a, 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 media, a middle, middle grade and a middle level performance wise? Uh, if, that's, if that's something that we hear back, then, then we certainly can look at you know, how, to, how that's going to impact our budgeting and things like that. Consistently what we hear, and obviously we hear from a certain demographic and you mm -hmm. hear from different demographics. But what we hear consistently in a demographic is, you know, we we want these are the these are the this is the kind of school system that we want as a community, and this is what our expectations are of, of the school system, um, and it is a high performing expectation for sure. Well, it, it, and see, to me, in the position we're in, it's more of a comparative comparative analysis with several broader Absolutely. considerations. Absolutely, and, and we need to say. Uh, uh, are we doing a good job with public safety? Mm -hmm. are
are we doing a good job to uh, uh, establish a tax level that is fair to uh, the lower income portion of our community uh, that since this is a regressive tax structure uh, and all the underpinnings of the safety net are being uh, undermined. Absolutely. So those are, it's a, it's a balancing uh, so that I think that's how I sort of come at it from uh, much more of a tripartite kind of, you know, the municipal side, the school side, the taxpayer right. side. And I think that's fair, and that's why I say if you look at a percentages of, you know, we, we can very easily break down what percentage of our budget goes to, to school funding. I think if you looked at surrounding communities and did a similar assessment, that's what I would be interested to see. If we're spending a disproportional amount of our, of our tax revenue on, on education, then absolutely that's a discussion that, that we can have. But I, I, I'm not so sure you'll find that. I'd be surprised if you found that. I think you may find that some of the other communities, their percentage of municipal budget towards education, not dollar value, just looking at percentage of revenue, towards education, I think you'll find that the communities that we consistently see better performance, those are the ones that are investing higher percentages in their education. Now, I, I'm not saying that as a, I, I'm just responding to the justification of looking at the cohort. I'm not saying that we want to be the number one. I, I mean, I would love to be that. I, that would be a very good moment for us if we could afford to do that. But, but part of finding that compromise spot is, yeah. is looking at where we are in relation to our communities and then deciding, okay, collectively, what, what, what is it that we want to focus on? What areas do we want? We have, it's a pie. How do we want to slice it up? The pie doesn't get bigger, we know that. The pie is shrinking. <laughs> How do we slice it up? And, then, and that's really, I think, where we, where, we, where we can make a lot of progress is to decide, okay, how, how are we going to slice this up? How are we going to divide it up? And, and you're right, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge across the board, and, and, and your challenges are even though they may be somewhat different and broader than ours, they're still similar. We still have contracts to deal with. We still have you know, uh, employee relations to deal with and things like that. And we all answer to the community as a whole as well. So it's, 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 the, it's the question of striking that balance and finding a way to, to, to put the best interests of everybody forward. And that's, that's the challenge in my mind. I think the other consideration for me is that you have to look at what's happened in the last one, two, three, four, five, six years uh, uh, as an important element of how you're going to appropriately balance fairly all the interests. And what you have is virtually no income increases. You have substantial property tax increases uh, and a municipal budget that has actually gone down 3%, whereas the school budget went up 16 or 17%. So when you there's a, there's a self-evident element to this, kind of, it just sort of screams out at you mm -hmm. that, uh, that, and that's why I thought it was an easy, unanimous vote of the town council that we would flat fund as a goal, just so that you, there is a certain Starting point. obviousness mm -hmm. about all of this. Uh, and it's not that people don't want to see the schools be great, everyone wants. But there is a certain reality here that I think we have to. I think I've always said I want the best education for my children that does not put my grandparents out of their home. <laughs> and that's what I've always said. I don't want the best of the best, but I want good enough for them and okay for the other end. So. And, and the other thing that we keep seeing, obviously, that everybody's well aware of is cutting of state and federal money. And, so, and they always hit. They hit the education side for the health and human services and all of that, and that gets hit so hard yeah. that where do you then come up with it from? And it just seems to be the never-ending cycle of... Can you give us an update on where you that. are with that and what you expect? Because that would be very helpful for us to understand as we kind of roll all this into... Well, well, well my, my understanding was that the legislation did, did pass the... Um, the um, revenue sharing amendment. So I, I believe in the biennial budget we'll get the same amount that we did last year. Um, well, <laughs> I'm I'm maybe. Sure. <laughs> I'm some, somewhere along the lines in the process. Right now it doesn't look like there's, and Tom, if you have other information, mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd love to hear that too, but I, right now it doesn't appear like we're going to be faced with a, an immediate reduction. That always comes back later on, um, but I think we're, we're looking right
right now at at it being the same level as last year, as far as I know. As far as I know. And you were at 3.7. Let's be clear. We're talking municipal revenue sharing. That's not general no, no, purpose education. I meant yeah. school aid, not, that, not municipal revenue that, sharing. That, that has to run through their formulation process, and again, that's 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 a yeah. That formulation process is is a is not something that we're intimately familiar with because it's a very complex and complex yes, process. Sure. Can you help us help me recall anyway? And I think Jessica raised this question to me a couple weeks ago. There was some unique thing that happened in the current fiscal year. It had to do with uh, federal jobs money back yep. four years ago and so on and so forth. Yep. There was an amount of our GPA withheld because of, for one year. Yes. And I think this current fiscal year is that year. Yes. So there was an expectation that that money would be kind of put back in and come back to us. Yeah, my concern is that I want to be cautious and not, not, not give you the impression that it's a one-for-one -one exchange. I don't know what that would do. Certainly, we're expecting not. We're expecting to be more in line with our standard funding formula. We were way off base last year. So it was kind of a one-year hit in the current That's year, our right? Because it was a it was a it was a penalty, right? It was, it wasn't they don't a call it. Yeah. It was based on they have 11 categories that you filter the money into that go statewide, and you have to fill in all the blanks. And because we use some of the money to retain jobs in the bus department, it took a hit on our transportation line. So when they ran the funding formula, and we had a different number because we used federal jobs money, which was kind of their intent, was to have us save jobs in some kind of a way, it took a hit in that line. Okay. And so when I they understand. ran that funding formula, they said, oh, well, you get X less the because... The so the methodology will not have that Correct. adverse line item this time? Correct. We, we assume not, but the funding formula is such that um, sort of like gray cloud on the black you box. Don't, the you don't change. understand, yes. you don't really know what percentage, what line. It's what very difficult for a layperson to look at it and go, okay, we got this much this year, this is how much our valuation changed, this is how much we're going to get this year. I mean, it's uh, very all difficult. things being equal, my expectation is that we'll see as much GPA funding as uh, next year as we've seen this year, which yes. You know, it would be great to say we, we'll be getting more, and frankly, if we do, that will be great news. Yeah. But at least that stems the past traditions of losing it every year. So yes, but again, that's all things being equal. Yes, I understand. all things being equal, and we're all we're always under the threat of a curtailment. Um, last year, it happened in November De or December. De December. You know, when so four hundred thousand dollars. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, as it stands right now, we don't foresee any um, any major decreases. Versus last year. <coughs> How about the? Uh, we got hit with what was it, five hundred and eighteen thousand dollars in yeah, retirement. Yeah, we just got something not long ago that said that they potentially could take that away again. Yeah, I think that's still up uh, up at the legislature being discussed. Um, I don't know if the new if the new um, uh, commissioner of education is, is addressing that specifically. Um, it, it's been. Lumped into the revenue sharing portion of things or not? No, as I recall, I mean, the, the difference, the change yeah. last you know, year. The, the, the can you back up just to explain yeah. to me what yeah. that issue is? I, I don't, I'm not an expert on it, but as I understand, the state changed uh, and, and required for the first time that um, local districts cover teacher retirement costs or some portion that was yeah. historically covered the by state the state. Portion, right? The it state's was portion, right? The state's portion. It was, yeah, it's 50 50, right? I believe. Right, and yeah. there was a, a, a grave concern through the whole budget process that we were going to have this huge hole in our budget. In the end, I think we almost came out uh, uh, whole harmless or maybe a little ahead because they accounted for that in the formula. And when they ran it, we actually received enough funds to cover what that funding gap was. That was when we went back out to validation vote. Right. right. It was some late we good news. Had right. some extra late good news. That we put back into the yeah, that's where we had the 200 stuff we put towards but, but all of this is subject to the mysteries of exactly. the funding formula again this year. Uh, but, uh, you know, at this point, my expectation is that we'll receive as much as we did last year. Um, and, and part of that's based on the fact that state revenues have actually rebounded fairly significantly. So I'm expecting that we're not going to be in a curtailment scenario, you know, where they find themselves mid-budget year in the state's budget uh, with big holes. Uh, they've got some spending issues that might create holes in, in DHS and other places, but I don't think it's going to be a revenue-driven crisis as it has been over the last three or four years. 
But the challenge is always as we face it, the intangibles that we're, that we're mm -hmm. looking at. So we, we will, when we come to you guys with the, with the budget, it will be updated with everything that we're aware of up to that point. Um, we're not anticipating any, as, as Tom mm -hmm. said, we're not anticipating any major challenges. I'm not sure about the retirement piece, how that's going to work. Um, that's certainly something that we'll, we'll look into for sure because that was a big, that was a big item for us as well. If it rolls into the, the, the state funding, the EPS, the general funding formula, um, that may play out, it may play out that way. Um, uh, that I'm not sure if that's something we'll look into. Just to complete the thought on municipal revenue sharing, where it stands, as I understand it, um, the legislature has passed with a, uh, a very hefty majority beyond two-thirds, so it's veto-proof at this point. Um, essentially adding 40 million or keeping the 40 million in in and so the 500,000 reduction that we had been looking at looks as though uh, will not happen uh, this is of course subject to the governor who has had 10 days probably has three or four now to decide whether he'll veto this uh, and then it goes back to the legislature presumably though it always happen hasn't happened this way uh, it would continue to get two-thirds support and, and override the veto. The word from Augusta is the governor is likely not to sign it, not to do anything, and he's threatened uh, n uh, to deal with to deal with it through not signing bonds for, for some reason. Um, but that that's the expectation is that he's not likely to do anything, so we'll we'll survive. We had we had a meeting not too long ago with the uh, legislative. Uh, representatives for our area and I believe it was Senator Millett she's on the Education Committee mm -hmm. I believe she's the chairperson. she made a statement pretty much said that no new requirements out of the Education Department would be issued that would Without cost funding. yeah that would cost the town anything now, I don't know how you guys keep track of all that stuff. You mean any new initiative that they were going to mandate? Other right. Other than I got a letter from Amy Volk that I took up to the Screenings Office that I'm sure you saw, mm -hmm. was that if they put together a pre-K program, that it would have to be self-funded by the town for the first, I believe it was like full for the first year. Mm -hmm. They might pay a little something towards the second year. The third year they pay a little bit more, and in the fourth year, Well, do you stand up and say we're not going to do it, or what? You have no, it's a mandate, <laughs> we're attached to it. We've, we've gone and talked. We've, we've right. had conversations we with them about, you know, gee, you know, you keep putting these mandates forward, and you're not giving us any money to put towards these, but yet we have to spend money to do this, to train people to do it, to have a program, to make a program, and we try to use other people. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're not looking to do that, so we'll go to be at a seminar and we'll say, oh, we well, see you've got a really nice looking tool that you're using for your teacher evaluation. Would you mind? And the educational system is very free in sharing what they have. And then you can then turn it into your own by adding the lines you need or tweaking something else, which is great, but you still have to fix it. Mm -hmm. you just, um, it's, it's interesting that they should have said that. We, we, also, we also have a requirement coming up on the state side of things, on the testing side, where they're going to go to electronic testing. And that could put us at a, um, that is one of the things that's driving, I think, part of what's driving the technology push at the high school level, because a lot of the state assessment testing now is going to be done online. It will all be done online. And Starting this year. Yeah. So we have to accommodate that somehow. And I don't think that that's a funded, that's not something they're going to give us a block grant and say, here, get your infrastructure in place so that you can support this. How, d how does a, a school way up north oh, handle stuff like that? They, have to, they, they get a lot of money from the state. They, they have to If you look at, and, and again, it, that's part of that EPS formula that, that's, 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 I don't want to say questionable, that's confusing because there are a lot of factors that go in and you'll find some communities will get a substantial portion of their funding from the state. 
and others like Community Point Scarborough. Unfortunately, we're on the opposite polar end of that. So we're in essence funding other school districts. And that's, that's, that's the methodology that the, that the state has decided. Um, the, the, there is a group of PICUS, uh, the PICUS group out of, out of uh, LA is doing a review of the state funding formula. They are presenting um, uh, their findings in reports that's online. It's a little bit, bit rough right now. Yeah, their first report had some inaccuracies, I think, in some of the data that they yeah. had. So they were reworking some of the reports that they were putting out. But I think ultimately the, the state is looking at, the, at trying to, if at all possible, reduce the complexity of the process somehow. I don't know if they'll succeed, but they, I think they've identified that as a problem and they've invested resources in trying to work that out. Because we're not the only community that's baffled by the process. It's, it's fairly common in the education circles to be asking the question of, well, how did you get to that number? <laughs> the education department also said that with that new report that was coming forward, that in order to fix any of these inequities, it would cost money. So it wasn't necessarily likely that they would be jumping on it right away, that it could potentially take a period of time for them to enact any changes, right. whether or not they choose to. No matter how, you, if you change the formula, there's winners and losers. So right. It, right. it's a pitch battle every time they mm -hmm. pull back the curtain and try to monkey with how they distribute funds. Right. And, uh, and you can expect those battles will continue. Dr. Entwistle had mentioned uh, to me when I met with him a few weeks ago that there was a million dollars that was going to be remaining available for spending in the current tax year, uh, in the upcoming tax year, and I didn't fully understand what it was he was talking about, but he said it was on the order of a million dollars. I think it must be a fund balance. <coughs> and a fund balance. A fund balance. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I was wondering uh, if you were uh, giving consideration to, uh, he was certainly giving consideration to the use of those funds, given the tight nature of our circumstances. So I wanted to put that on the table to, to hear your thoughts and make sure I don't misunderstand, again, being new, that what that is and what the flexibility is and all that. So Every year in the budget process we look at fund balance for sure because it's, it's always a question of, of what reserves do we need to keep on hand because we are tied to the town from the, from the bond perspective. Um, I believe part of that meeting those reserves were along those lines. Uh, reserves are really for some of the unfunded um, liability or funded liabilities or reserves. Generally speaking, I don't think the school can or uh, um, should carry hefty fund balances. Uh, it really should be paid I forward. Think there's two issues. There's there's the fund balance that's for the I believe it's 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 one month's worth of teacher salaries or one month's worth of, of district expenses that sit in an account in case something happens over the summer or something like that. Or if there's something well, you have to have your yeah, that's the okay. that's the we've we've successfully funded the teacher accrual, right. so that essentially um, has enough money to pay uh, through the summer months to, right. to finalize uh, the annual contracts. Uh, that's a separate account from fund balance. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And you have to. Have yep. Yeah. So um, that's not the million we're talking. No. About. Uh, beyond that, there are monies. You know, uh, I forget what your budget size is, but. Um, Budgets are your best estimate. Things happen in the course, and thankfully, either they've spent more th or they spent less than they expected, or they received more than they expected. The result is there's money left over at the end of the budget year. But every but every year that's evaluated and looked at, and that, mm -hmm. that becomes part of our budget. So that that fund balance we don't we don't necessarily want to deplete it to zero, but it certainly is part of our fund our, our calculations and our budget evaluations for sure. Yeah. And, and do you understand where that money comes from? It's, it's, it's like an insurance type of account type of thing. If something comes in that's, old, that's outside of the budget, you know, that we have to, that we have to, let's say a roof collapse. No, 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 no. 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 His okay. question is, what? how did you arrive at oh, the 775? Yeah. Or, or the million yeah. dollars. If there's a line item, say, and I'm just going to pick one, uh, supplies, and it came in under budget by $15,000, and then we didn't need to do any roof repairs this year, so it came in $25,000 under budget. You know, all those things don't just sit there, that they go into that lump sum. So adding it all in, mm -hmm. 
sometimes you have to spend something else on one of the other line items, and then we have to make that shift. And okay. uh, but nutrition is usually a, a I think, but I think to your out. question of what, where did the one million dollar establishment come from, I think that's a percentage, a certain okay. percentage okay. of the budget over the over the course. But I'll clarify that with Kate for sure. But but the fundamental, I'm sorry, Jane. Uh, this is money raised through local property taxation to support to, to support the school. And if it wasn't needed, I, I think the, the point is then it should be returned. I don't think you can expend it. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's how it works. I think you can't expend it in that year. I no, 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 but you can certainly include it as a revenue in next year's budget. And, and, we, and we do, again, and I think, I think that's part of our budget developmental process. So I, I think probably the best thing to do if, to, to alleviate any concerns that you may have is, is to get Kate to respond to that exactly, of what the, how the level is set, um, what the expectations are of, of, of that fund. Because I do know every year we evaluate how much <laughs> of that reserve fund to use in the budget. And, and then I think last year we took 200000 out of yeah. it, or 300000 or something. 200 has been, you know, yeah. the last three or four years. Right. History, so history and use would be helpful. Okay. Uh, you know, going back, how has it gone up or down over time? And, and what's the use been for each time it had to be drawn upon? So that, because I think well, we, it's a, it's a great source, obviously. It's nice to know in tight times there's this pot of money. It's used, I think, to reduce the overall ask in the budget. Right. That's the way it should be used. Right. That's exactly. right. Okay. Yeah. But the question is how exactly. much can we use and, right. and, and at what point do we set back? What what do we what are we carrying and why are we carrying it? Is that the right question? Is that yeah, the right question? Fair enough. Okay. A big part of the money that I uh, I guess we had last year was because of the um image use. So and the utility and the oil prices can change. So last year we had this big chunk because you know we had a good prices on the uh so so the image, you know, um, this year lower. actually like the protein was going on and everything. So we would have probably some more so those balance we will be able to we have to draw from you guys don't lock in your prices? We do, mm -hmm. but then this year's contract the price was higher. I we we were locked in for I think it was just a one-year contract last year, but this was is a two-year. Okay, so this mm -hmm. one's a two-year. Do they contract separately from, from us for that we price? We coordinate. Um, so Todd, actually, Todd Jepson is, is uh, far more skilled at this than I, so I often ride on his coattails, yeah. um, just because he, he, he yeah. pays more closer attention to energy pricing and stuff. And we're also dealing with multiple fuel sources, and that's one of the challenges we're having in the long-term planning community. We have oil and propane. I think the soil and propane will have geothermal at the, at the but, but we are dealing across the board with, with different fuel sources, so we're trying to long-term look at focusing on Yeah, to the point system. earlier of getting stability. Mm -hmm. Stability is the word that I wanted, mm -hmm. like my mantra, uh, whether it's stability in the tax rate and predictability. So energy is a great example. To the extent we can control our destiny yeah. and uh, control those, uh, those peaks and valleys uh, of external forces, we're going to be better off. It's going to create stability automatically, uh, but it takes time. It's not something we do overnight. Mm -hmm. you know. And as the private school definitely owed, and you know, it's not a facility cannot be upgraded every School operate off natural gas? Yes. We have a um, we do load shedding too during the summer months. Um, so when it's gonna be high, Todd you know, checks the days and the temperatures and all of that so we can get a lower rate in our um, you know, power. Right. So yeah, the, they actually subscribe to a program where uh, the the ISO New England will say we're at our you know, peak day. Typically it's late July, early August, uh, one of the hot you know, highest cooling days uh, um, produce the, the largest en energy demand. 
the high school is subscribed to a program where we'll actually go off grid and they'll run the, our on-site generation to power the building. Yes, um, that. And we yeah. actually get paid for that. Uh, I see. I see New England pays people to subscribe to that program. I don't think it's a huge amount of money, but it certainly saves. Blunter about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 mine's a broader question yeah. than that. 
I, I, you know, every every year we have um, in, in this in the budget we have a, a refresh program, um, and each each year a school a, a one school takes turns getting their technology upgraded. This particular year, I believe, is Wentworth's turn for upgrading, but it's a new facility. So I think the the initially the thought process is to take Wentworth's refresh money and redirect that towards the high school to get them up to standards for doing state assessments online and things like that. So it's still early on in the process. It was a proposal that was presented to the to the council. It's not firm and final. It's it's a it's it will I, I'm assuming it's going to go through the process that to all to the leadership council. To the leadership right. council. Right. No 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 right. Who's comprised of the leadership council? It's all the administrators, so uh, all the principals. Okay. The oh okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, special services, curriculum director, curriculum director help me okay. with other yeah. key plans. So that, and they, the they presented to us, and, and that was, I think, the, 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 the opening discussions to say, look, these are the kind of things that we're looking at, and this is why. Um, we're certainly going to be getting more involved in that process, and we have a, um, we have a Saturday retreat that we conduct with the leadership our team, budget our budget workshop with the, with the leadership all, team, exactly. and you're all, the, the, the town council and Tom and everybody's welcome to come and, and, and sit and listen and participate. And that's really where we start honing in on our on our on our real fine items of what do we want to do and why. And Saturday. we start filtering through a lot of those those processes at that point. Saturday, April fifth. Yeah. <coughs> and I believe it's here in the chamber. I think they open up both doors at A and B here. And uh, I want to say eight thirty but I can verify the time. And we'll we'll make sure that you all get so we'll send them off the okay, good, thanks. So that, you know, how does that date, I'm sorry, Jane, I keep interrupting, but how does that date square with the fact that I'm actually presenting the budget on the 26th of March? <laughs> <laughs> That's your, yeah, see, we went through the calendar. I thought we'd gone through this calendar. Am I wrong? It's not April. It must be, <laughs> it must be <laughs> early March as opposed to early April. If it's a formative budget discussion, it's too late. I have uh, April 5th as the as the school board leadership budget workshop. Mm -hmm. Saturday, April 5th. And frankly, the schedule has the council passing the budget in first reading at, uh, on April 2nd. So I'll, I'll connect with Kate and George. This is a schedule yeah, I've shared with them. I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have it in the So we'll have to shoot an email when it's all done. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess as a new board member, I have been learning something that I really understand the process. It's really, um, we are, we don't really go into the um, administrative issues. Basically, everything is decided by the leadership council before they are presented to us. So we don't have really have any say at this point. I mean, you know, we don't see anything until they bring up the you know, the recommended budget. So uh, I really want to, you guys to understand where, you know, we are as a board member, we are not really, uh, you know, as a mandate, I'm just suggesting just looking at what's the best way to do what we can do for the kids. And, and we are not really rested in the policies, but the budget, we are not really, um, we all basically contact is through uh, the superintendent, and he is going to deal with all the on the So yeah. that's what Some I. Some our program. And so we don't really have that much. We go, you know say um what's supposed to be done where in each school and you know until the budget all come to us and say this item we think is good okay. or not. So that that's what I want you to understand the process really. I feel at this point, you know, I don't really have any, any information I can provide or anything I can influence until I see those budgets presented to us. I, it certainly it, it is. It's a very similar dynamic. We direct the manager, and the manager directs the department's heads, and they present right. budgets to him, and he yeah. goes forward with it. Um, the school board process is you how, much you different. Know, mm -hmm. uh, um, I did want to just forward along um, one thought about um, 
certainly, you know, your laptop programs at your discretion. <laughs> it, we, we don't have line item authorities. Um, we just give you a whole dollar value. Um, but it was an idea that had come up repeatedly to me as a counselor, because of course it hit the newspaper. So um, to make sure that we fully explore all options about um, maybe not necessarily being fully funded through, you know, tax revenue. Um, a lot of communities have done different programs. I know you have explored some, whether it's a cloud type system or something tangible in their hand. Um, but certainly there's a lot of programs that, um, I, I think Massabesic, don't hold me to it, where you get as the child coming in at seventh and eighth grade, a school provided laptop. And then coming in freshman year, the parent has the opportunity to purchase it which reinvests dollars into the program for the repurchase later, and it gives you that similar device across the board to carry forward with the child. The other nice thing about that is, um, and I will be the first one to tell you, I as a parent am 100 times more likely, and I'm going to use the band program, I paid $1,800 for a flute. I see you misusing this thing, and I am going to beat you into a submission. <laughs> well, with the flu. So it, it definitely creates that higher level of they're probably going to take care of it. The parents are going to be on the kids about taking care of it. And I am certainly not saying every parent should have to pay. I, I, I would expect fully some kind of a, you know, for those folks that maybe can't afford it, to you know, you would have still money that you need to ask for for it. But um, but to really explore all those options where you have that joint ownership of it. Um, to, to, just to address that point, we, we, this is not a, 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 new, a new point for, for our board. We've been looking at um, the technology interface for some time. We looked at Jen Nichman, who we share for IT services. I did look, catch that meeting. Yeah, looked at, <laughs> looked at both the, um, um, bring your, which are you described know. as a bring your own device type of, of, of application. No, well, I'm saying provide the ability for everybody to correct me if I'm wrong though, um, provide the ability for everybody to purchase the same laptop, so the same HP 4400 that they're providing at the middle school right now through the main learning technology initiative. Is that what you're saying? So provide that ability for a parent to buy into that laptop, is yeah. what you're saying. Well, I guess I would, I would say, you know, again, uh, as, a, as a parent I would be a little frustrated at having to provide a cost for an infrastructure that probably should come out of the tax it's one of those things where this isn't yeah. a, it's not at this point, if it were a want, I would completely understand that when we're talking about, about parking or about an activity fee or something like that, I fully concur with that. If it's a basis required for the education process and we're developing our learning around it and we're developing our curriculum around it and we're required to test on it and things like that, that might be a rather difficult thing to accomplish in terms I would of, just, in terms of like I said, uniquely pointing out, yeah. we do it now well, with the band what, Is it a want so or a need? What's the percentage of school children in Maine who, who have this available to them at the high school level? Well, right, right now it's, 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 it's going to be increasing because as we said, there's another mandate that's coming down through that's going to require testing online. And right now, the way we have to do it at the high school is we have computer labs and computer spaces where you're constantly cycling kids through that, that space and that facility in order to test. In order to okay. test so um, it not only is it, is it is it from that type of application, but there's also some things on the curriculum side. One of the things that I had asked the, the, the leadership team to provide is a cost for textbooks update, let's say, because if we go to an online type of learning environment, that might alleviate the need to be doing textbook refreshes on a regular basis. Will it be enough to fully fund the program? I highly doubt it, but that is something into the cost-benefit ratio that we look at. Plus, it also allows the teachers to present curriculum in, in ways that are moving forward. We're, we're still kind of on the, we're, we're right now kind of on the cusp between 21st century learning and 20th century learning, and we're trying to make that transition. I, I firmly agree, and I've, I've said in the past that a lump sum like that is going to be a difficult thing, and there are, there are also some questions about how do we work that in the maintenance cycle. Those are things I think that we're going to be working out as we, as we move forward. So I, 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 hear, I hear exactly what you're saying. Okay. I, I will certainly present that as an option to say, you know, look, maybe, you know, are there other ways to look at funding? So how do we look at the funding portion of it somehow? But, but what is the percentage of children and high school kids in Maine? I don't, I don't know that off the top of my head right but now. But roughly. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't even guess. I, I do guess. know, though. Is it a quarter? I, 
the, I would have to say that have, have devices. What, what percentage of schools uh, have paid for uh, computers for children who are in high school? That pay for the computers or yeah. have access? Pay because for it, because that's what we're talking about paying for. Okay. It. I just want to know, is it a want or a need? Well, yeah, but let's be clear. We're not paying, we're not buying children laptops for them to go off and do whatever they no, want. No, no. It's, it's property of the school, and it will be, it'll be But assigned, it's a one-on-one -on -one yeah, situation. Right. So right. I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to figure out where are we? Is it a want or a need? Well, and one way to tell is, well, is it here yet? Right. Well, where we are in the lower level, so starting in the fall, this coming fall, uh, all third through eighth graders will be one-to-one. So now your, your students show up freshman year of high school, and suddenly you've gone, and I'm throwing a number out, I could be wrong. So I don't wish to be quoted as, <laughs> 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 I, I, I have to say, you're one to, I mean, we have right. a couple of computer labs, we have a couple of carts, and, and certain, you know, departments have a cart, and they rotate it through right. the various classrooms. So and there's no access right now, so if the child has like an iPad or yeah, a, you don't have any kind of board no, programs, the right? The infrastructure for that alone was more costly than to do a, a purchase. Mm -hmm. and Jen provided it it did seem to me that if you're three through eight at the coming school year, then uh, as, as we go forward, you could do ninth grade next year and 10th grade and 11th, and over four years, you would introduce the program. That's one of the, that's one of the opportunities that we're, that we're discussing, because I, I agree with you that all of that at once is, 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 is a question, and that's something that we're addressing with the leadership. Because my guess is that you're not talking about a capital cost of just a half a million dollars. You're also talking about a, uh, an operating cost that will be continuing of probably $300,000. The IT infrastructure. Because you're talking about with a thousand new kids online, you're talking about several IT people. No, I don't think we're talking to that extent because I know I know we've done a lot of uh, infrastructure upgrade to this point as well, um, and we're continuing to do that as well. Uh, I think the high school is pretty good. The Wentworth will be top notch. Middle school is. Yeah, to add a thousand. No, but it's certainly true. You, we will need, and, and I believe two is the number. Um, two additional staff people just to service 1,300 new laptops in the system. That, that's true. So that's there's true. ongoing operational expense Absolutely. as and a part of the expense. Okay. I, I think to address your original question um, is, is to say, I'm not aware of any metrics that are out there. I haven't seen any metrics that, that track computer usage. Maybe there's something that we can look at through the DOE. I'm not, I haven't personally seen anything like that. But I also would say that there are the, the state funding mandates again, or the state mandates that are coming through again. And, and one of the things that's helping us push us to that point now is I think we've delayed it and delayed it, and now with the online testing and, and doing some of the curriculum moves that the superintendent is looking forward to, to implementing, we're kind of at that, that, that threshold now. Now, what, maybe it's not this year, but certainly I can see within the next few years, two, three years, having something in place because we're going to have to address the needs from the state mm -hmm. to do the online testing. Could I um, suggest you at least look at the cohort group, that's the group that you propose as uh, the most comparable districts uh, and survey and be able to report? Uh, you already know a couple of those. I know that Kate has uh, provided... Well, let's not speculate. I mean, that, as part of the proposal, I think it would be helpful to have uh, you know, a definitive answer to mm -hmm. our... our I think you might have to pick up the phone. Jen Nitschman has done a, yeah, a fair amount of research on her own. She's talked to districts to understand what works and what doesn't. And who's got iPads versus ABC yeah. versus and, and then what grade levels and how? Certain costs associated with that, and that's one of the reasons why 
Uh, Jen's doing a great job at, at integrating all of our technology together under one type of platform and streamlining it that so that we're not buying a certain brand of laptop for the high school and a different one for the middle school and different ones for the elementary so that we have that seamless integration, that seamless technology integration. So Maybe another question too, maybe I could ask, looking at that differently, is just flipping that a little bit more, is if the parent can buy, I mean, I know you're saying it all needs to be one technology, so it's all one thing that's tied into each other. Is that one device as in, as long as it's an HP laptop, so if the parent does want to buy and let the child bring in, or does it have to be that one individual serial model, model number, or is it if everybody says HP, or everybody says Windows. Dell, or Windows. everybody yeah. says... Yeah, I think it's Windows, Windows. versus five different computers in the classroom and somebody doesn't bring their charger and their computer goes down. What do you, what do, you do? You don't have a spare battery? You don't, does that child go offline for the day? Um, you know, you have, if you have, a, if you have a, a, a homogenization of technology, you know, you can have spare batteries and spare cards where you can say, okay, you didn't charge your laptop, trade your dead battery in, here's a fresh one, we'll recharge that. So it, 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 the whole point is not to, it, it's a tool for learning. It's not the tool for learning. And we don't want it to be inhibiting we don't want it to be so cumbersome that it, it impedes the learning process. We want it to complement the learning process. And to do that, we have to, there are some logistic things also mm -hmm. to take consideration. But uh, I agree, one of my concerns is, is, is an explosion of administrative staff to cover. Now we have an IT group that's focused solely on that. So we're, 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 those are the ideas that we'll massage out with the leadership team too to say, look, the concept is there. We understand the concept. Let's talk about how we can package it and make it presentable in a way that we can, that we can work. When uh, well, I just wanted to point out, I guess, the other reason why I was, you know, please look at this. I mean, certainly, again, it ultimately, it's it's your guys' call on how you run the program. I just, at, from the finance standpoint, say I know you're talking half a million dollars is about X, Y, present on, on the interest rate, I um, mean, uh, on the tax rate. I, I mean, it, 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 it's basic dollars. I know if you're 500,000 more, it's half a percent or a full percent but it's not, it's out not the gate. It's not added money. Please keep that in mind. We're not adding additional money. To, we're not taking last year's budget and adding 571000 to it. The money that would be in allocated for the Wentworth refresh that's, that's in our normal planning cycle anyway, my understanding is that money will not be spent at Wentworth. We're just reallocating those funds to this process. So it's not adding $570,000 to the new budget line. Mm -hmm. It would be reallocating those funds for Wentworth. That's my understanding of how we're going uh, to approach it. So again, if, if, if even if in lines with the flat funding type of, of, of scenario that we're talking about, we're not talking about adding that extra, we're talking about reallocating those funds. I, I appreciate for the devices, but right. for the staffing, you are. That'll exactly. be a definitive dollar amount that goes. And the replacement. So. I mean, you're going to have to replace uh, at least a quarter of those every year. Yeah. Uh, just, just to keep the cycle. As kids graduate out and new ones come in, you've got to provide them I mean, th th there's a lot of issues associated, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is this is a new initiative, and is this the year to bring a new initiative on um, in view of our other challenges and priorities? I think a challenge. I was wondering, um, have you heard, talk, and I, I sent each of you an email about the issues we're having with the Circuit Breaker Program, um, <coughs> certainly because that's a huge impact for our um, older folks in our demographic. And interestingly enough, um, Tom, thank you very much, has been working with um, SEDCO um, mm -hmm. to work on our demographics and our vulnerabilities and trying to identify how much, and, and we are by large mostly in older population by, I think it was, it, it, it heavily outweighed the rest. So there, there's a lot of impact there. Um, that analysis will be coming, it's not done yet, so we'll have that on our end, hopefully maybe the next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there any word about the status of that? We as a council sent forward a resolution to the legislature to asking them to please reinstate the program. There has been some council outreach yeah. to some of our legislatures. I, uh, I don't believe the legislature is taking it up, but by all indications, I've talked to Democrats and Republicans and folks in May. I some think form of it. I think the, uh, at the very least, I, I'm virtually certain the legislature will 
undo what they did last year and at least enable us to have our local program. Uh, I don't hold much hope. In fact, there's no legislation currently pending to have the state return back to the old circuit breaker program and fund it at those levels. That's a different issue and no expectation in the near term. I suspect we'll never see that again. Well, didn't they institute some sort of a program uh, that's part of the income tax program? Yeah, it is called the property tax fairness, uh, fairness but it's, tax credit program. But it's, it's nowhere near. It's a quarter of the benefit that uh, right. used to be. Available. And a lot of people don't even qualify. That right. Qualify now. Exactly right. So the, the, the benefit, the rebate, if you will, is far, far reduced. Um, so at the very most, I, I expect, and I do expect, that we'll have the ability to run our own program. but it, we're not. Self-funded and self-administered. Yeah. There was an article in the Press Herald this morning that, mm -hmm. that talked about the fact that they were merely going to correct the error. Yeah. That was made in not allowing towns to run their own, fund their own program. And there was three or four floating around. Uh, I had heard, but but they identified the very low yeah. this tax fairness legislation that's presently in place and replaced the old circuit breaker. Yeah, I don't know why anyone is is is, is low in comparison. I don't know why anyone in the legislature or the governor would be opposed to having enabling municipalities to fund their own program should they choose to. So I'm quite confident it will get done. But unfortunately, that's still. And, an and the qualifications for the state program are high. Right. They have to be over 70. Right. I mean, it begs of a. Uh, uh, I'm concerned about administering it. Previously, we used to. One of our eligibility requirements was that they had to apply and receive, be eligible for the state program and. And with that eligibility, they automatically were eligible for us. So we didn't do any of the kind of uh, qualification. Now, this is, you know, essentially we're going to be asking for tax returns. It's based on uh, income tax returns. And it adds a level of administrative complexity that we've never had locally. Yeah. We'll find a way to sort through it, though. But that is true. Um, can I ask you a question, Chris? Uh, last fall, there was. Uh, Work going on about custodial services being outsourced. Not concluded. It still isn't concluded. So I have to give you the answer that you hate the most. And that they can't talk about it. Unfortunately, we can't talk about it. <laughs> 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 I know. There is or the contract There's issue. a fact finding report uh, that is due to be made public at some future point. I'm not sure what the 30 day mark is. So there was a delay. But the savings in that were was done. approximately three hundred thousand roughly. There are no, there's no discussion of savings because we don't know how the contract has been concluded yet. No, but that's what the, that was the number that was floating around there last fall. There was a number between uh, outsourcing would save between two hundred and fifty and upwards of three hundred and fifty. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A little more or a little less on no. either end. But we also have to worry about um, mitigating the end of the contract as well, so that might not necessarily be a direct. A direct revenue stream the first year, or direct savings. Whatever, whatever is there for savings may not be fully realized the first year or even the second year. Depending those on are part of the, the, the longer-term structural changes because okay. you may not see right. immediately, but you may reap dividends down the road. Exactly. Do you expect them, and when we visit again, that in the weeks ahead or a month ahead or down the road, that we'll see the fact-finding report? I would hope so. It's I would it should think be made so. Public. It should. It, it should be made public as soon as the there were of panel three, and so the chair of the panel, there's a dating situation, and um, somebody had requested some more time before the report had been released because they had been ill, so they had, okay. had an opportunity to so review the report and so on. So the date shifted by a couple of weeks. So, I mean, the fact finder has met that in December. The hope is that this will be concluded in order to work through this budget process. That's the hope. Nice. That there's no guarantee that that will happen because we don't. I don't know how, what what else is left in the process to be completed. But um, the hope is that we would complete it for this budget cycle. If not, hopefully, if certainly by the next budget cycle, it would be. It should be resolved by then. I would imagine. Yeah. By next year's budget cycle. For yes. Sure. Uh, whether or not by March 20, that. Uh -huh. To to be honest with you, probably not likely. But, but the impact isn't in this year anyway. It's yeah. 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 Could 
I just touch on one crossover issue, and I, maybe you're not even aware of it, but um, this came up at last budget year, and I think it's coming back around and being a definitive proposal with the new Wentworth School. I think there's interest on the part of the administration to have a third res a school resource officer that would be located in Wentworth come online. We currently, historically, have two. One at the middle school, who I think floats around and does some of the K-2 work and, and current Wentworth work, and then one full-time at the high school. So this is being bringing on a third full-time school resource officer. Um, if you're referring that it might be in a new proposal, I have not seen the new proposal yet, so I can't. Yeah, I'm just responding uh, based on information I've heard from the police department uh, who've okay. been asked to assemble those costs. So I, I, I'm anticipating that's going to come forward. Um, is that also part of the new security? Procedure the health, safety, and security. Well, I'm, I'm not been in terribly involved in that, so I, I don't know. Uh, perhaps who, it is. Who from the council is on the health, safety? Kate St. Clair is the appointed representative. All right. Kelly Murphy's record. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's where it came through. I know it came up in conversation last year, but obviously Wentworth was under construction and they kind of delayed that. I, I think yeah, it's. But, I mean, we use I just bring it up because it sounds like it's a new initiative. I, I'm not commenting on its appropriateness or not, but it's a it's a new cost. Good. Good. All right. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or last final? Just you know, maybe. Were, were there any other high priorities that had a high dollar cost associated with them, or surprises, or anything that that we haven't talked about? Well, we'll typically come forward with our, you know, our bus. Our bus. We have a bus cycle that's on where we purchase, you know, new buses one a year. One of the things that we're here to replace, so that we're not having so to our buses that we have needing to replace ten or fifteen at a time. We try to do it in a yearly. Have you have you ever taken a look at outsourcing transportation? Yes. And it's been talked about. It's um, not cost effective at this point that I'm aware of. Really? A lot well, of the small districts tend to do that because they um, encompass multiple communities and they have a but we our buses are so um, heavily used okay. that what it's really difficult to one of the things that most people don't realize is from a geographical standpoint, Scarborough is one of the largest physically large acreage mm -hmm. communities in Southern mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um And we have kids at all corners of the district, plus we have extracurricular events that we're obligated to provide transportation to. Um, so our bus system is probably right now overutilized, where we have a transportation shortage at this point, more with drivers than we do with, with actual physical buses, I believe. So um, outsourcing that is, is um, we, we right now we're supplementing some of those, and I think it's coming through a booster funding um, where we can on the shortfall side of things. But that's not certainly the long-term solution. And I, I think what we found is the cost of outsourcing even those smaller portions is 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 very yeah. expensive. Now, would we be able to negotiate a better deal if we did a bulk thing? I don't know. I also don't know what we would lose in terms of control. Um, how would we handle snow gate? How would we handle resources and, and management and things like that? Or training, or state requirements for bus drivers, and all that other stuff. That's, that's, that would that would involve a very thorough investigation on whether that was appropriate. Or not. Hmm. And, and um, I'm sorry, just to, uh, pleased to help. The town's actually assisting a couple of the extracurricular activities. Uh, I believe the uh, hockey program and swimming diving program. These are activities that require constant travel to practice and you know event facilities outside, outside of Scarborough. Uh, and the school was no longer able to, to meet their busing needs. And so actually with the advent of our new um, bus that the town council approved, that bus is being used. We're being paid. Uh, it's uh, it's Senior's a senior's bus? Yes. Um, you know, unfortunately for the hockey program, they practice at uh, 4.30 a.m. Uh, that bus isn't being used uh, for other <laughs> town purposes. So you know we have a driver and we're being paid for that. Uh, it, it's not as much as they would have to pay if they were going out to get private transportation. So it's a good way to yeah. to do it. Um, it. But we're hoping that's a short-term fix. I mean, not that the performance yeah. isn't, isn't there, but I mean, ultimately that's something that yeah. we're, we have to evaluate as well. But but one of the things, one of the launch.
monitoring challenges that we faced uh, uh, and we've talked about over the over the years is, is you know what are we considering capital improvement and what are we funding through capital improvement. Mm. And and you're gonna you'll see things like some of the technology will come through capital improvement and some of the bus transportation and things like that. And then from long term structural fixes we're always talking about at what point do we break that into operational side of things and push that through and how much is really operational versus how much is long term capital improvement, what's really capital improvement. So so I don't pr you I'm not sure what you're used to or accustomed to, but you may see things in the capital improvement budget that you'll look at and go, why is that there? But yeah. usually there's a there's a discussion in the thought process of what what's there and why it's there and why it's not on the operational side. Does DPW uh, do the maintenance on your buses? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And they do a fabulous job. And they yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is that why it's not cost effective to, uh, to uh, outsource it? I'm sure that plays into it. Like I said, I, I haven't, we haven't done the analysis, so I don't I don't know exactly what it would take. But but certainly we're that's one of the areas where we're doing shared resources. And yeah, I mean, it's very positive for, from our side of things. They're 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 really good. They they Local turn things. it around. I mean, if we have a bus that breaks down in the morning and we say we need it back by 1:45 to make the afternoon run, they're really yeah. they're yeah. they're working it over. No, I've seen their oper their operations well. impressive. So it's uh, it's huge for us. Tom and, and I went through it you know, last month and it's. I just appreciate these buses are dropping kids off at the high school and then immediately hit going back out, and this is true of the middle school too, mm -hmm. to pick up all the K2s right. and, um, and Wentworth kids. Uh, and with then starting the process all over again in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> Each bus will, will pick up a run of high school and middle school kids mm -hmm. in the morning, starting at somewhere between 6.30 and 6.45. Drop off to the high school for 7.15, 7.20, then they go right down to the middle school drop off. Then they, that bus will then either have a run, that most of them do a Wentworth run, mm -hmm. and then they drop off at 8, 8, yeah, 8 o'clock, and then they go immediately. They may not go to the same area of town that they pick the original kids up from in the morning from the high school, but they could be at a different area of town because that's their run because it's right. too hard for them to get back to that mm -hmm. community. Well, that's been it's fairly it's common huge. for as long as I can remember. I mean, that was the part just back when I was com oh, yeah, coming through the school, right. so it's and not and substantially we different. To that yeah. as possible. Imagine so doing that, that by paper. Point of no paper. So if I can just recap, these are some things that we that you guys are looking for for us to follow up with, and if if I miss something, please let me know. Um, we need to find out um, what, what's going to happen to those retirement funds from last year, how those are going to be put in the budget. Is that, is that fair? Mm -hmm. um, we need to ask Kate about the surplus fund, why the level is what it is, and, and how much we how much we need to carry through and, and how that's established. Um, then we need to review the cohort of local communities to see who is providing laptops to the high schools. And then the last one was, was Tom's. Um, a third school resource officer at Wentworth. We need to find out if that's in the works as well. Can you do your cohort on the high school laptops? Can you also do um, the, I know you said you have it at the lower levels. Can you get that as a whole comparison? We, we can ask. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if anybody's keeping track of this stuff, so I, it would be tasking somebody on the administration to make the phone calls. And yeah, I don't think it's terribly complicated when you're yeah. in the ten, 10 or 12 districts. It's well, and sometimes they have, like Kate Bolton, uh, our business manager has a group that yeah. she meets with monthly for various yeah. things, you know, for a other business managers, business. right? And so I'm, I'm seeing kind of like yeah. and I think Jen has a fair amount of that. Yeah. She she did her research in, she did when we were in formulating her proposal. The high school yep. Anything else that you guys can think of that we didn't that we didn't respond? I, I guess we just make, uh, and I'll talk to George and Kate, but I want to make sure our dates are aligning. They, I, I pulled it up. They are. That's what we have in our calendar. Hmm. So um, that's probably maybe something we want to address. Well, my uh, schedule is not changing. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. <laughs> and I, I will say, as much as I would like to, um, I think it'd be an interesting workshop to attend. I know I won't be because that will be my daughter's birthday party. So mm -hmm. um, she's sweet sixteen and would have my head if we didn't. Have is there any other quick questions or is everybody no, feeling that's great. Thanks for, for, for coming and, and 
having a meeting with us, and, and it's certainly helpful. And um, I guess at this point, there's no other questions. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, I will. Second. All right. All those in favor? Yay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the next meeting for us will be in March. Um, we are working on. If I can hold this up enough for you guys. <laughs> It'll be March. Oh, and I wrote it on the wrong thing. So we've got those dates, but I guess March 18th, yeah. March. It'll be Tuesday. That'll be our last meeting before where, we start. Where did you get the this? I stole it. Uh, uh, it. We had it at our last meeting. He gave it to us, but this is the clean copy because we had to do a few dates. Okay. Just ask him. So, yeah, this will be the stuff we're working on the next time. Um, and we have one more meeting between now and when we'll start the budget process. So this will be the kind of, you know, disposal, you know, who, what dynamics do we have in town for uh, people? Um, that's what I would say. I was trying to pull it up. The most compelling of the data is the breakdown of health health and public age. Surprisingly, the senior population makes up a large percentage of the lower income groups. 49% of all households, all households earning less than 25,000 are hosts old age 65 and up. And she didn't copy. That's just to you. And, uh, They're still working out the rest of it. But, yeah, um, no, I meant because we didn't. Yeah. We have and this will all be the next. So we'll be getting uh, um, a so little. There's three, yeah. It'll have um, three documents, which is great. You know, employment, yes. different statuses, occupations, just like some of our local industry. You want to forward that many, to us? Uh, yeah, you will have all of this. This will be our, right. our materials for right. our next meeting. So you just very, very impressive that they really took it and ran with it. So it'll have a lot of really good in depth. Um, that's in -depth fantastic. Information. That's fabulous too. So it'll have, yeah. a, have a better sense of well, the know, dynamics of the community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's difficult people are out there. Well, we are the Good oldest. We, we are the oldest town in the state. That I did not know. That's what we I mean. We are the oldest. The oldest I know we're the oldest state, I, I but I don't know we're the oldest we town. The <laughs> no, I guess it doesn't mean that we're the oldest town in the. Country, uh, are you talking age-wise, or we were incorporated the first? I, I yeah, like the I incorporated first part. <laughs> we are the oldest town in the state that is the oldest state in the nation. Uh, I did not know that. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, you know, and I, you say, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's an oddity. I think we've had, well, again.